Welcome to the Yellow Birch Grove, the Adirondack Mountains here in northern New York, where Birch Boys leases 220,000 acres of pristine, privately owned timberlands to harvest wild chaga. After eight years working hands-on in the forest to source wild chaga, I have learned that this is one of the most misunderstood organisms on earth. The information that exists online on chaga's health benefits is far superior than the information that exists on chaga ecology and chaga's life cycle. And that's the gap that I want to bridge in making this video. Oh, that is a heck of a chaga. I have a lot of experience with this fungus, and this is a conversation that has been waiting to happen. Thank you for tuning in to listen to what I would consider to be the top 10 misconceptions on chaga. I know notice obliquous. Let's get right into it. First misconception about chaga. Chaga is not a mushroom. What? <laughs> Seriously, despite what you've read, despite what you've been told, despite the fact that every time you see the word chaga listed online, the word mushroom almost always follows, it's true, chaga is not a mushroom. And uh, we're gonna break this down a bit. Let's start with what is a mushroom? A mushroom is defined as the reproductive organ of a fungus. It makes spores, it's the spore bearing fruit of a fungus. They pop up from time to time when the conditions are right, when the mycelium has grown, and there's enough moisture in the air to produce this fruiting body to spread spores. One fungus may produce tens, if not hundreds of mushrooms throughout its lifetime. Uh, so while all mushrooms come from fungi, not all fungi produce mushrooms. Chaga, the piece, the conch that actually grows out of the sides of birch trees that we harvest and make tea out of, it, that's actually a fungal organ known as a sclerotia, an aerial sclerotia. A sclerotia is defined as an immune mechanizing source of uh, micronutrients and the control center of defense for the fungus. And it's specific, it's an organ that's specific to parasitic fungi like chaga who are actually growing on a living birch tree and killing that birch tree because the birch tree is sending its own immune responses to the chaga. It's trying to heal itself and it's trying to dispel the chaga. And so the fungus that actually occupies the birch trees develops chaga, the sclerotia, um, as fungal armor. It is a source of compounds that it uses to protect itself from the birch tree. And ironically, that's why it's so good for us. Uh, you know, mammalian biology and DNA actually has ancient roots in the fungi kingdom. Mammals branched off of fungi. And so for, when you look at our DNA, we're actually a lot more similar to fungi than we are to plants. And so chaga as a sclerotia that it develops to protect itself from the birch tree is like one of the core reasons why it's so good for us. So it's worth knowing the difference because it's not just another mushroom. You can't stack chaga next to reishi, lion's mane, turkey tail. Cause I mean, it's a whole different thing. Those are all mushrooms. Chaga is a sclerotia and it's worth understanding what that means. Misconception number two on chaga, that all chaga is made equal. And I don't think there's anyone going out saying that or projecting that but what people do sort of assume is that if they tried chaga if their friend brought them chaga if they bought a chaga product that they then have understood the chaga experience and know what chaga is and it's just <laughs> not necessarily true there's a lot of examples i could give you but uh one very clear one is that uh chaga will kill the birch tree once the birch tree dies then the chaga will start rotting. And often you have people who don't have a ton of experience harvesting chaga, but they can recognize chaga and they'll pick it off of a dead fallen birch tree and it will taste like dirt. It will taste terrible. 
And a lot of people that I know or have met have tried chaga and through that way. And that was their introduction. And I'm like, listen, you gotta try chaga from us. You gotta try the right chaga. And the other thing is that there's commercial products made by very prominent figures with chaga that is grown on myceliated oats and on brown rice flour and things like this. Um, I'm just sort of using general terms. I don't know exactly what they're growing this fake chaga on. And by they, I mean the big guy. <laughs> there is one guy with a very prominent mushroom company with a very big name who is selling chaga extracts that look like this. Apparently this is a chaga extract. This is a real product from a real company. I'm not going to show the label because I have class, but this is seriously one of the most prominent brands in the industry. This is their chaga extract. Now compare that to a Birch Boys chaga tincture. Chaga extract, chaga extract. Something does not add up here. Do you see the incredible difference in color? That's melanin, that's soluble melanin that exists in wild chaga, which is obviously prominent and coming through in a Birch Boys tincture. And you have a total absence of one of those primary constituents of value in the prominent brand chaga tincture or chaga extract. And so I don't, I don't use this example just to, to call anybody out. Um, I'm not gonna mention any names, but a lot of you can probably figure out who this is. And I just don't agree with the notion of marketing chaga products for health benefits when you totally, you totally ignore the value of wild chaga, why it's important. It is a sclerotia that has to grow off of a living birch tree in order to form the powerful healing conch that is chaga. So there's fake chaga on the market. Make no mistake, it's basically total fraud. They can call it chaga because it's the same species, but it's not the same thing. So not all chaga is made equal. Uh, very important to understand that. Misconception number three is that chaga and the birch tree have a symbiotic relationship. This simply is not true. There's no evidence to suggest that chaga is anything but a parasite to birch trees. And I'm not gonna talk much on this one, I'm just gonna show you the evidence. There was a big piece of chaga and it either fell, either it fell or it was picked. Uh, but this is what the chaga does at the end of its life. It kills the tree, it, it rips open the bark in a vertical way all throughout the tree's trunk, and then it reveals the chaga poroid. And all of these here, all these flakes are like filled with chaga spores. And all I think this is a really educational piece here because this is what chaga does. It's a parasite to birch trees. It penetrates the bark. That's what the genus Inernotus means, to penetrate. And then it takes over the entire heartwood of the tree and at the end of its life actually rips open the bark of the tree somehow and this is where the spores come out i'd like to show you something about this dead birch tree it was killed by chaga chaga is a parasite to the birch trees there was a study out of finland an oncologist who estimated that between six and 30% of all birch trees are, are killed by chaga. Another piece of chaga, another dead birch tree. Another example of death by chaga. Everyone thinks that harvesting chaga is like killing the tree and it's like- No, the chaga is killing the tree. Yeah, the chaga is pretty, pretty ruthless. Yeah. Another misconception about chaga, chaga only grows on birch trees. While it's definitely true that chaga primarily grows on birch trees, chaga 
grows on a variety of different tree species. I'll show some proof here. It has been found on maple trees, pop poplar trees, elm, elm trees, hop horn beam trees. Uh, also called ironwood, cherry trees. And then there's a diversity of birch trees or birch species within the birch genus Betula that chaga uh, grows on. Chaga is not as powerful as maybe other mushrooms as, as supporting the immune system due to the fact other mushrooms have a higher beta-glucan concentration. I've been hearing this a lot. I've been seeing these silly infographics that will rank mushrooms on their immune supporting power solely based on their beta-glucan content. It's just a very basic way of looking at chaga. It's a very incorrect way of looking at chaga because, you know, beta-glucan is, for typical mushrooms, one of the key indicators and in micronutrients that has proven immune supporting properties. However, um, to, to assume that that the beta-glucan is the most powerful among all of the other things in chaga is just, it's just not doing justice to anything else in chaga. I mean, it's chemistry going on in chaga is insane. It's beyond our ability to comprehend. And the way that these compounds are being classified and um, understood, it's, we're still in the very beginning stages, but however, there are some we're starting to, such as inotodiol. Uh, betulinic acid, betulin, trimetanolic acid, or melanins, fungal melanins. Um, there's polyphenols in chaga. These are all things that have immune supporting properties. Some of these, particularly the inotodiol, uh, the trimetanolic acid, the ergosterol peroxide, gallic acid, the betulin, in my opinion, a simple Google search, any amount of research on the literature that exists on the effect of these compounds um, on immune functions of mammals or studies in vitro are, make it very clear that beta-glucan is rather meaningless in terms of the incredible immune supporting power that all of these other things offer in chaga. And, and really to, to think that we can rank chaga lower than turkey tail or lion's mane on some sort of stupid infographic that is based only on beta-glucan is just silly. And it's looking at chaga as just like a basic mushroom. And again, it's, it's overlooking the entire life cycle factor of why chaga produces a sclerotia. And uh, I would be very skeptical of people selling mushroom products, including chaga, that don't really, really understand that about chaga. Misconception number six about chaga is that chaga takes an extremely long time, up to 10 years, to grow to full maturity and produce spores and actually reproduce. This is so cool. I had to show you guys this. I stop and I'm looking right at a piece of chaga that would have been so easy to miss. This is the chaga right here. It's growing on a, a yellow birch tree, Betula alleganiensis. I can basically wrap my hand around this tree. This is so cool because this chaga has already sporulated. And it's a really great example that chaga actually can penetrate a young upcoming forest. And if the tree is young and skinny, the chaga is able to fully mature, you know, develop its sclerotia, and sporulate and reproduce without taking the, the 10 years that chaga typically takes to grow. So the age of chaga and, and the time it takes to reach maturation, where it can produce sexual offspring, is completely dependent on the age of the birch tree. And contrary to uh, the very concerning common belief that chaga takes at least 10 years to grow and produce spores, this guy proved us wrong. This is a one or two year old piece of chaga. And this is loaded 
for chaga spores. This is a poroid. Misconception seven about chaga is that Atsi the Iceman, who was a, a nomad from the Copper Age, found preserved in ice for 5,000 years. The myth is that he was found carrying a piece of chaga on his person. Now, he was actually carrying a mushroom called the hoof polypore. Um, that's also a mushroom called the tender fungus. There's many common names for mushrooms, but specifically he was carrying Fomis fomentarius. Understandably, that was misattributed to chaga uh, because chaga has that same characteristic and ability. And I thought this would be a cool opportunity to not only explain the misconception, but to demonstrate that chaga works as an incredibly great uh, fire starter. It's, it really will hold an ember for an extremely long period of time. It won't go out. I've taken a piece of chaga like this. And I've actually fully submerged it in water that I've pooled in my sink and then set it on the countertop to show a staff member at the time just how good this is. And it reignited. It reignited after being fully dunked underwater. So I, I was explaining this just because you have to be very careful. Chaga is extremely flammable. Um, it's never going to burst into a flame. But once it gets started, it simply will not go out. And it won't be obvious, it will just slowly, slowly burn. And I learned this myself when I used to dry chaga in an oven. And I would only set the oven to 180 degrees. And I would do it in a big pan with ground chaga. And I don't know what happened or how the oven worked. Maybe it was old. But a spark must have gotten into the ground chaga because an ember had started. And I, I tried to save and separate the chaga that had started burning when I smelled the smoke. And I just couldn't, it became such a mess. And this whole pan of chaga never caught into a flame, but the whole thing was burning. And uh, it works as a beautiful incense. You know, that's still going. So, one can totally understand why they thought Atsi the Iceman was carrying Chaga because he very well could have used Chaga to do the very same thing, probably even better than Hoof Polypor. So <laughs> again, when if you do this ever with a Chaga chunk, remember it will not go out. You know, put it underwater, leave it there for a few minutes. Don't trust that it's out. Misconception number eight about Chaga is that Chaga has no historical indigenous use here in the United States or that all of the traditional usage of Chaga occurred in Russia and Siberia. So this is a topic that really isn't very well documented. There's not a lot of information about it online. And unfortunately, I believe the reason for that is because uh, colonization era, we destroyed a lot of this knowledge and history. Um, but I've been fortunate enough to learn through a number of customers of mine uh, who are the Haudenosaunee people, uh, the Iroquois Six Nations that occupied uh, much of what is now northern New York and Canada and the Great Lakes region, uh, who actually lived in longhouses built out of birch bark, uh, the yellow birch and golden birch tree. They use this as the exterior for their longhouses. Uh, they, of course, also used chaga, not only as a natural medicine um, that they would brew into a tea, but they also used chaga and they smoked chaga. Uh, the Haudenosaunee would actually mix chaga in with their tobacco. Uh, and again, tobacco was considered a sacred medicine in their culture. It was often given as gifts at the bases of birch trees when chaga was harvested, but chaga was used to enhance the experience of smoking tobacco because it was believed that there was a benefit from actually inhaling the burning chaga. It also increased the duration uh, of the tobacco smoking experience as you just saw with the 
uh, example, burning chaga, it actually would make tobacco smoked in a pipe last longer. So there is a lot of indigenous history of chaga usage here in the United States. Misconception number nine about chaga is that since it's been about 10 years since chagas started to be talked about, for its health benefits and all of its properties. And still, we've heard nothing from the medical community. There has not been any acceptance or embrace of chaga in Eastern medicine. Um, it's not prescribed by doctors. So chaga must not work. You know, it must be some humbo jumbo. That's misconception number nine. And I just wanna elaborate on this for a minute and make a clear distinction between something like chaga, a natural herb, I don't think it meets the definition for an herb, but just call it a natural herb for a minute, and then a prescribed medication. Some differences between natural herbs and prescribed medications, uh, there's a lot of differences. Herbs or chaga, anything like that, a natural substance is going to be rich in a number of different constituents. There's all sorts of different compounds in chaga. And each of these compounds, whether it's healing or not, they're all going to be present in different concentrations, which will vary from piece of chaga to the next piece of chaga. So the world of prescribed medication typically is much different. It's taking an isolated compound or an isolated micronutrient and then you know, amassing it in extreme quantities, a very specific milligram dosage, and then performing a clinical trial on that one compound and testing it on hundreds, thousands of people among all different ages and demographics, etc. And only after a clinical trial has occurred will that become a medication. Now, it'd be great if there was a clinical trial on chaga, but it's unlikely that will ever happen. A clinical trial costs millions of dollars to actually sponsor. So um, it's much more likely that a company is going to focus on a specific isolated micronutrient within chaga, such as betulin or inotodiol or trametinolic acid, and try and figure out a way to synthesize that in a lab so that they can patent a process to produce a medication and build a business plan around the clinical trial that they're going to run. I mean, that that's just the way that Eastern medicine works. And it's extremely true that a number of pharmaceutical companies and researchers are looking at the constituents in chaga. They're trying to figure out how to synthesize it in the lab. And I believe that many of these things will become patented medications. People will never go and get chaga from the doctor, but it may be possible in in some day in the future that someone will get a prescribed medication that is actually a constituent humans discovered because of chaga. So I wanted to make that clear. It's not that chaga isn't good. It's not that chaga can't work, but if anything stemming from chaga is ever going to become a medication, it's going to go through the Eastern medicine process. And uh, that's the difference between chaga and a naturopathic, uh, homeopathic sort of remedy. Misconception number 10, last but certainly not least, is that chaga harvesters are a leading threat, the leading threat, to wild chaga's sustainability. Logging in the timber industry is much, much, much more going to be directly responsible for the way that not only chaga develops, but our entire forests. You know, every piece of timber, uh, yellow birch trees included, have commercial value. And what you may not know is that already for a long time, uh, numerous companies have it in their sustainable forestry management plan to kill birch trees that show signs of chaga. Really much of the forestry industry looks at chaga as an invasive parasite that is a threat to uh, the viability of the timber value. 
and it also looks at it as just like an unhealthy disease to the forest. Um, so, and I'm not saying that's true. I disagree with that fundamentally, right? And I think that there's a triangle of interdependence between birch trees, chaga, and people. Uh, but I don't think that anyone's looking at it that way. And really the harvesters, you know, there are responsible chaga harvesters and people who are thinking very long-term about this. Uh, like myself, there are others. And uh, we talk about this a lot and we each have a different perspective on it. But like to, to think that chaga harvesting is going to threaten chaga before the logging industry or the effects of deforestation threaten chaga or are threatening chaga every single day is ridiculous. Uh, one of the harvesters that sells me chaga um, basically started selling it to me because it's part of her job to go and kill and cut these trees anyway uh, to get rid of them in the forest and for years the chaga was just just thrown out i cannot tell you how many stories i have heard from locals about hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pounds of chaga just being thrown away uh people call it excuse my language some loggers call chaga horse cock because it ruins the inside of the tree um so seriously this this is a big thing uh, the logging industry has not caught up to realizing that chaga has value. Um, that's a generalization. This is a conversation that uh, their logging companies and land management companies are becoming much more receptive to, much more interested in. And I think that in general, the theme of sustainable, well-rounded forestry and permaculture-based ideas is being embraced. And I think that's a good thing. But... If you're looking at a city area or an urban area, yeah, you're not going to find any chaga, not because they're chaga harvesters, but because there's no trees that support chaga. There's, there's no old growth stands of yellow birch groves. Uh, there's nothing there. You know, anywhere that we're cutting down forest and making farmland, making cities, making highways, making parking lots, making developments, that is the biggest threat to chaga and any of these other wild organisms that we fear are in danger. There is a range of different birch species that support chaga. There's a range of other tree species which chaga less commonly is found on. And, and each of these trees in the tree's sustainability, the abundance of this specific tree species in any region is going to be directly indicative of the capacity that of chaga to grow. What I am trying to do in, in my sustainability protocols is harvest chaga at that point of sporulation. So when the chaga actually does rip open the bark, if you get there rather immediately after it does that, uh, or I say immediately, but within a month or two, the chaga is still going to be good and vital and strong and it will have already reproduced. And then you can harvest 100% of that chaga having already let it do its job. And then by visiting that tree and actually, you know, knocking around the bark, getting the spores on you, moving throughout the forest, you, you can participate as a symbiotic agent of the transmission of chaga throughout a forest. So, I mean, chaga can become so successful in its virulence as a fungus or as a parasite uh, that it can actually do itself a disservice and, and kill the eligible hosts. So really what this is all about is good forest management practices. When we think about how we look at a sustainable future for Chaga, it is an embrace and acceptance of this within the overarching industry of forestry and an appreciation and support for wild harvested Chaga. There's nothing that frustrates me more than seeing people who grow fake chaga on artificial substrates. It's not the same. It's fake. It's total fraud. So, so when you have companies doing that and saying, you know, these wild harvesters are the bad guys because chaga is going to become unsustainable, those people are really just greasing the wheels for a world where we just don't recognize the value of nature and the fact that, no, we actually can't make chaga better than nature does. So instead of treating wild chaga as just irrelevant and unimportant, because that's going to be what kills chaga, 
Um, we need to embrace wild chaga and support wild harvesters and just make sure that there is a code of ethics uh, in, in how that is done. Any harvester that is in this for the long haul will inevitably develop that uh, code of conduct. We don't work with harvesters who are just looking to make a quick buck and harvest all the chaga around. I mean, this is these are people we've been working with year after year, people who have careers in the woods, um, and it's in all of our best interests for chaga to thrive. There are also very simple conscious efforts you can make while you're harvesting. You know, we are mammals and we have the ability to consciously participate in symbiotic relationships. Like I said, when you harvest from a tree that has just sporulated, you can be an agent of the spread of those spores. Insects are one of the one of the largest spreaders of uh, chaga spores. My pictures under my microscope of chaga spores, there's insects all in there riddled throughout and the, the insects that go from tree to tree, spiders, um, the, these things all are spreading spores too. So when we're looking at chaga sustainability, it's also so much bigger than just the chaga harvester. It's even bigger than timber. It's, it's, it's the spiders, it's the bugs, it's the caterpillars. It's, it's about the naturopath, right? So it is extremely hypocritical to use products that poison the ecosystem or get poison into the food chain or, or pollute our forests or, or be complacent in deforestation. If, if, if you're doing all that and then, you know, complaining because you, you heard it, that chaga harvesting is unsustainable, you got to do a reality check because there are a lot larger forces at play and uh, humans definitely need to change their ways. And I think that the chaga harvesters are uh, a little more forward thinking than the rest of us in that regard. I think they, they recognize that. I think it is a total misconception that chaga harvesting is unsustainable. Um, that was a long one and I covered a lot there, but I think, I think it's worth sharing.